the words that thou hearest are rich with records of dreams and visions. Those who have an eye, visions given to them, let them see, given to their saints and prophets. Those who have an ear, let them hear. Filled with symbology ancient as the soul of man, little of these visions can be understood by intellect alone. And St. John's Revelation is totally a book of visions. For unto the least is given the power to know the presence of his God. This interpretation of St. John's Revelation was made possible by a key furnished through the readings of the Christian mystic Edgar Cayce. It was the result of seven years' research by a dedicated group who found guidance in their own dreams. And by using the Casey key as they studied the visions of John the Beloved. represent John's highest self, that never corrupted awareness in each of us, which can speak as the divine, the Christ within. In terms of modern psychology, this is the authority figure, the over-self, or John's super-conscious mind. In Casey terms, this is the Christ within. John's over-self explains the mystery of the seven stars. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the golden candlesticks are the seven churches. As we think of churches as meeting places, so in the key supplied through Edgar Casey, the seven churches are the meeting places within John of body, mind, and soul. Modern science knows of these meeting places as glands or centers of the endocrine system, fountainheads of various kinds of energy. Science lists them beginning with the pituitary, the master gland, whose hormones regulate not only growth, but the hormone balance within the whole body. The pineal, just above and behind the pituitary, sits deep between the lobes of the brain. Its function, science still doesn't half explain, but admits an association with memory. At the base of the neck is the thyroid, the pace setter, the center of the will. Then, the thymus, the gland that carries our immunity and aids growth in childhood. The adrenals, 
that respond to the pituitary, both via the blood and through the nerves, to control bodily needs, particularly in fear or in anger. The cells of Leydig, only recently proven to exist and known to have something to do with imagination and creative thinking. The gonads, seat of sexual energy, and as Casey said, also the generator of bodily energies. In John's vision, each of these centers is shown to possess a mind cell, symbolized by the star or angel of the church. To these angels or mind cells, John's superconscious again directs him to write. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou... Ephesus, or the gonad center, is the first to be warned against misuse of its powers for self-indulgence. The energies must be used constructively or impotence will result. Moving upwards from the gonads to each center in turn, the fault of each is listed. The cells of Leydig have often misled through their false urges and false imaginings. Pergamus, symbolizing the adrenals, is told that these energies have often been misapplied in anger and fear. Proper application of these forces can bring about regeneration of the body through regular acts of will. The thymus at the level of the heart is deceptive, the figure tells John. Rightly understood, bodily healing stems from this center. The thyroid is the seat of the will. Its fault lies in its weakness. Thou livest and art dead. Hold fast, and I will not blot out thy name from the book of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Only the pineal center, which records all experience, the seat of memory, is commended for its faithful, flawless service. Thou hast kept my word. The pituitary is the master gland, exercising control and balance over the other six centers. Its fault is indecision. Thou art neither hot nor cold. It is told to be decisive. Buy of me gold, tried in the fire, and to improve its sense of values. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. After the churches, or glands, have been told wherein they lack perfection, a new phase in John's revelation begins. John is shown a throne, surrounded by four beasts, seven lamps, and 24 elders wearing crowns. In the midst of them is a sea of glass. <laughs> Emblematically, this is a glimpse into the control room, showing the relationship of the body-mind to the infinite. The sea of glass represents the state of John's emotions, which are under perfect control during his vision. The four beasts around the throne make up John's animal nature, which stems from the four lower centers. 
The seven lamps are a new symbol for the mind cells of the seven endocrine centers. The same mind cells earlier symbolized as stars. <laughs> The 24 elders, here shown surrendering their rulership to the divine within, are 12 pairs of cranial nerves which lead to the senses, hearing, sight, smell, touch and taste, and the motor nuclei. With the elements of John's body and mind now under control, a new inner pattern is shown to John from the throne. The pattern of the Christ within. The lamb as it had been slain. To whom is given a little book sealed with seven seals. This lamb-like pattern symbolizing patience through suffering is acknowledged by the senses to be their rightful ruler. The book is the body through which life's lessons are experienced. The seven seals on the back of the book represent again the seven endocrine centers. The lamb is about to show John the power of the forces within each center. One by one, the seals are open. The power of bodily forces moving through each of the four lower centers is symbolized by four horses that issue from the book. The white, the black, the red, and the pale horse. The opening of the three higher centers is accompanied by earthquakes, bodily trembling, and mental blackout, as consciousness is now centered in the subconscious only, as in sleep. In chapter 7, control of John's consciousness is portrayed as four angels holding back the four winds of the earth that is, the forces that move the four elements of the body, the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the soul forces. In actual body structure, the classifications would be the bones, muscles, and tendons of construction, the blood and all fluids that maintain life, the brain and spinal cord, and the central nervous system. With bodily forces immobilized, a minimum number of cells are consecrated, chosen for a special purpose, like Israel. The influence of these consecrated cells is powerful enough to spiritualize all other cells in time. Were these 144,000 cells throughout the body to be assembled, they wouldn't even cover a man's thumbnail. When the pituitary seal is opened by the lamb, the lamb being the symbol of the Christ within, the angel trumpeters sound, that is, all the glands are stimulated by the pituitary hormones entering the bloodstream. The opening of the id, or repressed area of the subconscious, follows, and John is freed of the odious hybrid forms of thought which have impeded his progress. John is now told to eat the little book, seen opened in the hand of a mighty angel. That is, 
to assimilate the lessons of what happens to the body when all the centers are opened. John, now alone and on his own, must carry out the example of the Lamb. In chapter 11, John is given a rod with which to measure the temple, that is, to take stock of his inner development. The outer court, or the body, can be left out, he's told. Two olive trees and two candlesticks are to bear witness to John's self-examination. These are the subconscious and the superconscious, which are the vehicles for all healing and supply. Whenever the energies of these witnesses are dissipated through lust and debauchery, healing and supply are shut off for a time. John's account of his own experiences ends here. From chapter 12 on... The Witness Speaks. Of the universal soul of man. Whenever the energies of these witnesses are dissipated through lust and debauchery, healing and supply are shut off for a time. John's account of his own experiences ends here. From chapter 12 on... The Witness Speaks. Of the universal soul of man. now seen travailing to give birth to a child. A red dragon is waiting to devour it as soon as it appears. However, the newly born child escapes from the reach of the dragon. Thus, the infant mind of universal man is shown to have come out of the soul, which is here symbolized as the mother. The angel Michael wars with the dragon, for even before man came into materiality, the rebellious urges, as the dragon, had appeared with the creation of the conscious mind. Duality in man had begun at that point. The defeated dragon is cast down to earth. The symbology shows that the mind of man and the devil of self-will will be entrapped together in materiality. The mother, or soul, also escapes the dragon by being withdrawn below the conscious level and eludes involvement with the emotional tides that flood out of the rebellious urges. John next sees a great beast, another symbol for man's emotions, rising out of the sea. Which means, through his feelings, man is ruled by his desires, whose light stems from the urges of rebellion, the dragon forces. From the earth, a second beast emerges. This one incorporates all the urges of the first beast in the various forms of merchandise which keeps the desires in flame. The image of the beast, spoken of in verse 15, is the materialistic idol worshipped by those who give it life. To recall
recapitulate. With the coming of man, a parallel activity takes place. Self-will takes over in the first separation from God. Man has not yet come to materiality. Once the rebellious nature is activated in the emotion, the creature spawns physical drives which rule the unspiritualized man through his senses. The beast places his mark on the forehead or the right hand of his worshippers. That is, the unspiritualized man, whether he works with his mind or his hands, performs in patterns recognizable to his own kind. And no man might buy and sell save he that had the mark of the beast. That is, individuals who do not have the characteristics of the beast mentality are not acceptable to this fraternity. The number 666 symbolizes the relationship between natural, unspiritualized man and his creature, the beast, who developed out of the earthly desires. this materialistic element are the spiritualized 144,000 perfect souls in the earth and their adherents. Through them will come redemption for the whole earth in the pattern of the Lamb or Christ consciousness. However, the time for reaping what has been sown approaches. From the very heart of universal law come the seven restraining influences, symbolized by the seven angels with the seven last plagues. That is, the soul records are opened, activating forces that bring balance in the world. One after another, the seven angels pour out the contents of the vials they carry on the earth. The seven angels, as seven agents of divine will, work through the seven glandular centers of man to bring about his instruction through periodic general breakdowns. As man's institutions crumble away, the dragon and the beast yield up three unclean spirits out of their mouths. That is, the propaganda of distortion that has misled mankind. The whore of Babylon, symbolic of the prostitution of man's spiritual powers, is shown sitting on a scarlet beast emblem of man's organized structures that are created for self-gratification. The beast that was and is not and yet is, as recorded, means that it's figurative only, yet its influence in man's history is very real. The woman is drunk with the blood of saints and martyrs, that is, with the energies and vitality of well-intentioned men who have given their lives to the mechanisms of the beast. From the seven heads of the beast mentality emerge seven kings. These represent seven basic types of cultural cycles which rotate through history. Each culture embodies the strengths and weaknesses contained in each of the seven endocrine centers. Thus far in John's vision of man's history, conflicts between the higher and lower forces, epitomized by the lamb and the beast, have kept peace from the earth. The fall of Babylon is announced. 
meaning that the commercial enterprises based on appeal to the sensual nature have collapsed. Throughout history, this has usually meant the collapse of the culture itself. Thus is man set free from his self-created monsters which have enslaved him. Once again, the symbology shows the white-robed elders, or senses, this time of collective man, bowing down to the highest forces. The angel instructor shows John the preparation for the marriage of the bride and the lamb. This marriage indicates the merging of the mentality of man with the mind of God. This pattern activated in the world would bring about the millennium. John joyfully attempts to worship his instructor, who warns him, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. John sees a heavenly being on a white horse, leader of angelic hosts. This is man's new relationship to the forces because he has overcome. The infant born to the woman in travail has come to maturity as the ruling force in the world. The figure on the white horse now thrusts the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire. That is, once the new man is divinely motivated, he's able to overcome his own creatures which have misled him for so long. The dragon, which had spawned the beast and the false prophet, is now confined to the bottomless pit for the period of a thousand years. As the result of the temporary elimination of this great force, the evolved souls arise to enter their rightful positions of power in the world. This is called the first resurrection. A thousand years of peace and harmony brings about an earthly paradise for those Christ-conscious souls who, through their suffering, have become truly human, devoid of the animal nature. However, after the thousand years period, the dragon is loosed again. This is brought about by the remaining souls coming into earth, bringing with them their unsatisfied ambitions and desires. This upsets the balance again. This time, the devil, or the dragon of self-will, is finally thrown into the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet are. This is the second death the experience of those who have come into understanding and then fallen away. Through craving fulfillment of the earthly appetite arising from the cells of the body, they experience the second death. John now sees the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. The superconscious mind explains that the city is man's perfected state which can perfectly manifest the divine within. The dimensions of a city four square is simply a mathematical equation for perfection. The gold and precious stones are earth experiences transmuted to gems through the purifying fire of stress and strain. The throne of God and the Lamb is shown with a stream of pure water flowing from it. This is emblematical of God and perfected man being one in will and purpose. The tree of life is watered by it, which brings perfect healing and supply through natural means. The so-called curse, the self-induced 
limitations on man in the earth has now been removed. Again, John attempts to worship the over-self with the same result. See, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. The over-self, the Alpha and Omega, gives more information about himself. He represents the real entity, the original state of consciousness still within each man. Man at the point where the human touches the divine. Now the Christ consciousness explains that man, through setting the seven endocrine centers in order, can redeem himself from earthly experience by eliminating the desires that bind him to his old patterns of action. The warning is then given that the book or the body holds the keys to man's ultimate redemption out of the world. Anyone tampering with it for selfish motives will incur those afflictions listed here. And then the final blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. 